Hey everyone, so for today's lecture, we're going to be looking at the uh, birth of political parties and kind of the growth of division um, in the newly formed uh, United States following the passage of the Constitution. Um, so this period kind of begins around 1793 and will actually go up to about 1855. But this is really when political parties became a prominent part of the government, prominent part of American society. So as Americans, when we think about government, it's often hard to um, take away these ideas of politics from our government. Um, we see you know, a picture of Barack Obama here with his children, and his wife, um, and of course the famous MAGA hat from the Donald Trump campaign. Um, when we think about this, we tend to think of Democrats and Republicans uh, as one thing within the government. We think about politicians on the road, um, campaigning, kissing babies, uh, sucking up to the people, trying to get elected, trying to prove their worthiness to you, um, and you know having their different sides and uh, playing the political game. Politicians often try to sell themselves as the people's champion, that they're one of the people, that they will represent your interests, represent the citizens of the United States. Um, and so what, really when we think about government, we think about politicians trying to sell this idea to us. This idea of politics and government intertwining was not always the case in the United States. In the beginning, it was actually meant to be very different. In the beginning of the government under the Constitution, um, there were actually no political parties. Uh, the framers of the Constitution intentionally left out political parties from the Constitution because they had beliefs that they were undemocratic and they would split the nation. Um, they thought, you know, Madison had a big fear of factions within the government. So they thought that political parties would create factions of the, within the um, government and could cause a split. Um, George Washington was officially not a member of any political party. So the first president of the United States was not a member of any political party. But while they were in the constitution, the parties actually kind of created themselves organically. They created themselves. Um, parties naturally formed over differences, um, differences of opinions, difference in values, uh, difference in ideas. So really in differences over economic policy, over foreign relations, and over the power of the national government, um, parties kind of created themselves. The first political party to have power in the United States and to become a prominent political party was the Federalist Party. Uh, this is not the same group of individuals that uh, represented the Federalists in the um, in the Constitutional Convention, although they do share very similar values, um, and you know some of the same prominent people are members. But this isn't as if the group that was in the Constitution Constitutional Convention went out and created a party. This happened several years after the Constitutional Convention. Um, so this party came to power in the early 1790s, and John Adams. Um, the second president of the United States was a leader of the Federalist Party. So they believed in very similar values, the idea of Federalist, powerful, strong national government, um, and they were the powerful party. So as mentioned, John Adams was one of the Federalist leaders, was the uh, second president of the United States, and also Alexander Hamilton was one of the Federalist leaders, as he had been um, in the Constitutional Convention. He continued to carry on these ideas of a stronger national government. The Federalist party really believed in the idea of a strong national government. They thought the federal government should fix problems and lead the country. Uh, they thought with a newly formed constitution, the power lot laid in the hands of the national government, so that government should lead. A huge aspect also of the Federalist Party was the idea of fast economic growth. Uh, the Federalists really believed that the national government, the federal government, should promote a commercial economy. Um, they should promote industrialization, should promote um, trade and manufacturing so the country could grow quickly. Uh, they wanted to see wealth grow. They wanted to see um, capabilities grow. So the Federalists were really supported because of these ideas in the Northeast, um, in those areas such as Philadelphia and New York, uh, the large harbors, the areas that were industrializing, um, and they were really supported by bankers and businessmen. So the wealthy people of the Northeast um, really supported the Federalist Party because they were the party that supported um, using the national government to support economic growth, to um, promote economic growth. But the Federalists also really upset a lot of people. Um, you know, there were people throughout the country who did not want a strong national government, who did not want to see industrialization, um, to see the government lead economic growth. And, you know, these people tend to be people in the South and Western states and the territories. Uh, you know, these areas had had a tradition of freedom, of not having a strong national government. So they did not believe in the ideas of the Federalist Party. 
So in the idea of this economic growth, uh, the Federalists created a national bank in order to speed up the economy. Um, this was an idea that was championed by Alexander Hamilton, and he became the first Secretary of Treasury, which was responsible for running the bank. Uh, they believed the bank was necessary to stabilize and improve the nation's credit and improve handling financial business um, within, the, within the newly found um, government of the Constitution. Uh, but the problem is this national bank actually angered laborers and farmers who thought that the government should not give special help to business owners. They thought that this was showing favor to people who own business, um, that they were able to do business on a banking level with business owners. So they thought that um, many of these people thought this was an overstep of the power of the national government. Federalists were also successful in passing a treaty um, with the British known as Jay's Treaty, John Jay, uh, the first um, chief of the Justice of the Supreme Court negotiated this treaty. Um, and what this treaty did, this treaty was in 1795, and it was in the midst of the French Revolutionary Wars, and it was a treaty between the British and the Americans, um, basically settled some differences, issues that had been uh, existed since the end of the Revolutionary War. And so uh, what this treaty did was require British troops to leave forts in Ohio. Remember, they had left their uh, troops in the Ohio area. Um, and what happened is the frontier settlers thought that the treaty was too gentle on the um, on the British. So these people in the Western territories really thought that they were these British people were getting away, the Brits were getting away, and that um, the American government was giving in to certain demands from the British. Another thing that was upsetting people about the Federalist Party was their foreign policy um, against France. Um, so in the years between 1798 and 1800. Uh, during those French Revolutionary Wars, uh, French ships were actually seizing American vessels in the Atlantic. Um, and so John Adams, the Federalist president, decided that rather than uh, to do rather than um, go with a diplomatic means to end this, he uh, authorized the American Navy to fire on um, French ships if they were trying to get seized. And so basically, this was kind of an undeclared war, undeclared naval war. Um, for about two and a half years in the Atlantic. And this really upset uh, Southerners uh, who were supportive of a close relationship with France. Remember, France had been America's ally during the Revolutionary Wars, and they were also a major trading partner for the Southern goods, um, cotton, other things coming out, tobacco coming out of the South. So the South really wanted a closer relationship, but the Federalist Party, um, led by John Adams, was having a war in the Atlantic. So another political party began to rise um, out of the ideas of the Constitutional Convention, um, and these were the Democratic Republicans. Uh, they kind of opposed ideas of the Federalists, and they can really draw their roots back to the idea of this anti-Federalist lobbyists in the Con Constitutional Convention. Again, not direct descendants. They didn't walk out of the Convention of Philadelphia and create the Democratic Republicans, um, but they were people who had had similar ideas. So some of the prominent leaders of the Democratic Republicans were Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. The election of 1800 was actually a huge political milestone. Um, Thomas Jefferson was elected president of the United States, and he was a Democratic Republican. He replaced uh, John Adams, who was a Federalist. So this is the first time that power was transferred peacefully from one party to another. Uh, and this can be referred to as the second American Revolution, because you have to think like tr having political parties in place, people who oppose each other, having a peaceful transfer of power is a huge aspect of having a functioning republic, a functioning democracy. So the Democratic Republicans really trace their um, ancestry, their their ideas back to the idea of this anti-federal. Like I said, the idea of a weak national government. Um, they were worried about the Federalist idea of a really strong national government um, that would abuse power. And what they saw with certain these things, with Jay's Treaty, with the National Bank, with the undeclared war in France, was this idea that the federal government is really taking on a lot of power and it was upsetting a lot of people. So what they wanted to do was rein in the federal government, the national government. The Democratic Republicans also um, went against the idea that the government should support fast economic growth. Uh, they believe in the idea of kind of slower growth. In particular, there's an idea tied with Jefferson. Jefferson believed that the economy of the United States would work best with agriculture, with farmers um, dominating the economy. People could own a small plot of land, farm their land, live as free away from the government. Uh, and this was Jefferson's kind of ideal for the United States. Of course, in the areas where the Federalists were unpopular, the Democratic Republicans became popular in the South and the West. These ideas of owning a farm, of being free, of not having the federal government, the national government 
at your doorstep, forcing you to do things was popular with these people. So they were supported by farmers, artisan, and frontier settlers. So one of the big political milestones in the country was the War of 1812, which of course began in 1812 and lasted until 1815. Uh, this war occurred under the administration of James Madison, who was a Democratic Republican. Um, the Federalists actually strongly opposed this war. Um, of course, with Jay's Treaty, they had um, negotiated with the British, but they wanted friendly relations with the British. Um, and Madison declared war on the British over a variety of trade disputes over long existing antagonisms um, that had left over from the Revolutionary War. Um, and so the Federalists really opposed this. And they actually met in Hartford, Connecticut, and what was known as the Hartford Convention. And here the Federalists kind of tried to come up with some ideas of what to, was to be done about the war, what to what was to be done about the Democratic Republicans, and they actually threatened to secede um, as a result of this war. They were they wanted to leave the union created by the Constitution. They they were kind of threatening the idea. And when the war ended in 1815, um, this kind of idea spread through the idea of the um, of secession uh, was seen as unpatriotic and treasonous. You know, people begin to see like that's you're going to leave the country. Uh, so what this really does is actually destroys the Federalist Party. So with the destruction of the Federalist Party, uh, this actually led to what is known as the era of good feelings. Um, this was a period in which the Democratic Republicans ran the country unopposed from 1816 to 1824. This is in the aftermath of the War of 1812. And this kind of marked an era in political history of the United States when there was one party leading. Um, and it reflected kind of a sense of national purpose and desire for unity among Americans um, following the war. They kind of all saw themselves together. Uh, they had a single political party they were supporting. Um, they had seen the ideas of the Federalists being treasonous. So they're really going forward. Um, and, you know, it's known collectively as the era of good feelings. So another political milestone was the election of uh, 1824. During this election, there were four candidates for president, all of whom were Democratic Republicans. Um, and Andrew Jackson actually won the popular vote. And he won a majority of the electoral vote, as you can see um, in this diagram in these graphs. Uh, but what happened is Jackson failed to win the absolute majority in the Electoral College. Um, you see he won 38% uh, of the vote to John Quincy Adams, 32% of the vote. Um, and so what that means is the 12th Amendment actually dictated the presidential election would then be sent to the House of Representatives, um, whose speaker and actually candidate for president was Henry Clay, gave his support to John Quincy Adams um, in return for being selected as Secretary of State. This is what was known as the collective bargain. Clay, as Speaker of the House, um, decided to in influence the House to decide that Quincy Adams, John Quincy Adams, should be president over Andrew Jackson, even though Andrew Jackson had won a majority of the popular vote and um, a majority of the Electoral College vote. Um, so the corrupt bargain brought John Quincy Adams to power and kind of created some discontent with the political system in the United States. So the next political milestone will be in the election four years later in the election of 1828. Um, so Andrew Jackson, you see there, who we know from the $20 bill, is um, of course upset. He feels that the election was stolen from him, from John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay and the corrupt bargain. Um, and as a result of this, Jackson leaves the Democratic Republican Party and forms his own party, simply known as the Democratic Party. Um, this, is also significant because in many states, this is going to be the first election where common white men voted um, for the first time. And what happened is states were replacing land requirements. It used to be that you had to own land to vote. Um, they were replacing that with poll taxes. Um, so you had to pay a small tax to be able to vote. Um, and what this does is increase voter participation by 300%. Um, and so this also leads to Democratic Republicans quickly disappearing. Um, Jackson's new party will come to power in this election. He will be elected president and um, the, the Democratic Republicans will quickly disappear as a result of the election of 1828. Andrew Jackson's an interesting character, um, interesting for the idea of politics. 
um, in the sense that Jackson kind of was the first politician to try to sell himself as a man of the people. Um, Jackson kind of tried to present himself as a commoner, um, tried to sell himself the idea of him to the people of the United States. So he had been a war hero. Um, he was a general during the War of 1812. He um, grew famous in the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, he got the nickname Old Hickory um, because his soldiers referred to him as Hickory because of his toughness. Um, and so he kind of tried to sell himself that he was this war hero, he was a common man, but he was actually one of the wealthiest planters in the United States. Um, Jackson had a over a thousand acre estate and owned 300 slaves. Um, so this is really where you get the idea the first time, kind of trying to sell the idea of the man of the people. So one of the things that begins to happen with the era of Jackson and will have a lasting impact is the idea of um, having to sell yourself to the common people um, of having to create an image um, and creating an image in a democracy um, over substance, you know, in a democracy trying to, um, you know, rather than give people policy, give them complicated ideas, you create this image um, that you sell them. And we see this in politics even today. Um, and so one thing that happens with Jackson is uh, there's a story of him as a young boy, and that's the picture you see here. Um, on the right is that he was a young boy during the um, the Revolutionary War. Uh, he declared his allegiance as to the um, to the colonists as a patriot, and uh, was captured. His family was captured by British soldiers, and one of the British officers uh, demanded, said, "You boy, shine my boots." And Jackson, being bold and brave. And um, all these characteristics that he would try to sell himself as refused to. And so the British officer uh, pulled out a sword to try to kill Jackson. Jackson puts up his hand to block him, is cut on the hand and um, is hit on the head. Um, and Jackson actually had a scar that he claimed this was this confrontation was from. And the thing is, um, we don't know how much of this exaggeration, but what this is, this is a tale that people love to tell about Jackson and that Jackson loved to repeat about himself. So this really doesn't say a whole lot about how Jackson is going to be as a president, but what it says is it gives this imagey, image of a tough person. Um, he is selling the idea of himself with this story. Another one of these images that Jackson liked to tell and that his uh, supporters liked to spread um, was the idea that came out of a duel in 1806. Um, Jackson uh, you know, was challenged to a duel by a man, Charles Dickinson. Dickinson was known as a great dueler, um, was a ac very accurate shot, had been in many duels. Um, and so what happened back in this time was that so a man could char could challenge you to a duel and you basically go walk paces, turn around and try to shoot each other. Um, yeah, this is how Alexander Hamilton died uh, in facing Aaron Burr. Um, and so, you know, Dickinson kind of keeps up, keeps challenging Jackson. Eventually Jackson, um, he keeps insulting him. Eventually Jackson agrees. Um, and so they meet for a duel. They walk back to back. They walk their 10 paces, turn around, shoot. And Dickinson, being a better shot, hits Jackson right in the chest. Um, Jackson says it said he stumbles. Uh, there's blood coming out of his chest. Uh, the people go to celebrate Dickinson, believing Jackson is about to die. But Jackson stands firm, um, loads his gun or points his gun and unloads and kills Dickinson. Um, and so the quote from this is Dickinson says, my God, have I missed him when he shot, even though he can see the blood coming out of him. And Jackson is quoted after killing Dickinson saying, I would have stood up long enough to kill him even if he had put a bullet in my brain. Um, and this is kind of the idea. This this is almost a myth of Jackson, um, how strong he is, old hickory, the toughness of him. He could stand there with a bullet in his chest and still fire. Um, this was something that, you know, the image over substance. Uh, his supporters love this story. Jackson loves telling this story. Uh, it was kind of this idea of um, you know, this image of Jackson. This doesn't have anything to do with being a good president, but it's a good way to sell yourself. Jackson, too, was he was also important for his campaigning. Um, it wasn't just selling himself, but he's also trying to sell himself as president. Um, so he wasn't afraid to make grandiose promises, make huge promises for what he was going to do as a president. Um, he focused on the idea of the commoners. Um, these people now had the right to vote. So he kind of focused on things that they would be interested in. And he also made outlandish claims about his opponent, who's pictured there, John Quincy Adams. Um, he claimed that Adams was not an American. 
uh, that he's actually French. He claimed that he abused little girls and that he was addicted to gambling. So he's slandering openly his political opponent um, as he is campaigning. The era of Jackson um, and in the 1820s is really what we could think of as the age of the common man. Um, and this can really be seen as when democracy kind of begins um, because before, you know, it's just wealthy landowners are voting. Now, um, candidates are really trying to appeal to the common person or trying to get the vote of the commoners. Um, and so this so this can really be seen as you know the origins of when democracy really starts to take over um but it could also be when the beginning of um the spoil system begins and so what the spoil system is um when jackson wins in 1828 he uh he quickly fills a lot of the government positions service jobs um with supporters friends and relatives as a reward for supporting him um so the idea is they spoil the people who support them um so they get positions in the government if you are elected Campaigning kind of represents um, the idea of an election, the idea of democracy in the age of the common man in the 1820s. Um, this is during a county election. You can kind of see people are excited about it. People are drinking, hanging out, um, enjoying being part of democracy. That's what this represents. Um, they now, you know, don't have to own land. You have to pay a poll tax. Um, you can participate in this. And so this is what Jackson really exploits. Uh, these commoners, these government try to appeal to them. So with the growth of democracy and the um, influence of the common man being able to vote, um, of course, you're going to have more people voting. That means there's going to be more different groups, different diverse ways of thinking, um, different um, interest groups, different people are going to have different passions, different things they care about. Um, so this is a symbol here. The symbol you see on the right is it says, am I not a man and a brother? So this is a symbol from an early abolitionist group. Abolitionist, abolitionists believed in the end of slavery. Uh, they were... Um, they became more politically powerful in the Northeast, of course, in the Northern states that don't own slaves. Um, other interest groups were women's suffrage groups. Um, these were usually middle to upper class women who began to support the idea that women too should have the right to vote. Um, there was a temperance movement um, in the 1840s, really, that began to take movement. Um, and this was a movement towards the temperance, uh, tempering the consumption of alcohol. Alcohol tended to be popular uh, throughout the United States, um, but you know, particularly in places that didn't have clean water supplies, such as cities. Um, you know, the main things to drink was either water or uh, milk. Milk spoils, and the water is contaminated in cities. Uh, you have you know people using the bathroom in it, um, dumping stuff just in the water supply. Uh, so you can't really trust it. So people drank alcohol um, as something to drink, and there was a big problem with drunkenness all the time because of this um then also there was there was uh nativist movements um and these were really movements to stop immigration in particular irish immigration so groups that were living in the united states really became interested in trying to stop immigrants from coming to the united states so one of the big movements for the women's suffrage movement was a cynical falls convention in 1848 um and the seneca falls declaration comes out of this this was a group of middle and upper class women who met and they wanted to have full equality with men um susan b anthony and elizabeth caddy stanton were two of the leaders um and so this meets in 1848 the idea is that they want voting rights uh they want the rights of men um and so while this is influential they actually were not successful until 1920 in gaining the right of women's suffrage so Andrew Jackson's party of the Democrats um, become, you know, probably they're kind of the party of the commoners, you know, as Jackson tried to sell himself. Um, they were especially popular in the South where Jackson was from, and they really supported slavery and states' rights. Uh, they thought that the national government should stay out of the right, that the state should have more power, and they supported slavery. So, of course, new political parties uh, begin to rise out of uh, um, in the aftermath of the Democrats winning. Um, two of these parties are the Whig Party and the Know Nothing Party. Um, the Know Nothing Party was kind of a single platform party. They rose out of the nativist movement um, and they really opposed immigration, particularly Irish and German immigration. Um, they were based on the idea of just stopping immigrants um, from coming into the country. Uh, the Whig Party, um, rose up in kind of opposition to the Democratic Party. They tended to align themselves with Northerners, um, with wealthy industrialists, um, so kind of filling in that void from where the Federalists had left off. What we see by the election of 1840 is that 
these um, ideas of democracy have really changed the political system in the United States. Um, how politicians and what the power, where the power lies in political parties has to do with the idea of selling themselves to commoners um, and to the idea of being the party of the commoners trying to sell these values, um, sell these images. Um, and this is something we continue to see today. Um, and that's kind of where the seeds of this come from. Um, so in the election of 1840, the Whigs try to present themselves as the party of the commoners. Um, remember the Whigs uh, are Northerners. They represent kind of wealthy merchants usually, um, but they try to sell themselves differently. And what they do is is it, it's seen in this picture here is known as the hard cider and the log cabin campaign um so what you see here people distilling hard cider alcoholic cider um and living in log cabins so what they're saying is we are the party of booze and living in log cabins we're just like you um we're about alcohol and you know living out in the woods just like you so here you see a campaign poster for William Henry Harrison, who was a member of the Whig Party. Um, and see here, he's seen here farming his fields, the farmer of North Bend, it says. Um, he's a common man, you know, and he's for reform. Uh, it's a, to the log cabin boys, to people who live in log cabins, vote for this man. Look at him. He's out here working the fields just like you. He could be president. Um, you know, he has your values. So that's where we really see, we see this today in society. These are the, um, the seeds of this, the origin of this political, um, this political nature in our political parties are, as this democracy has grown, as people try to appeal to the image and to appeal to the commoners. This was a little bit longer. Let's have a quick review. The party system um, is not mentioned in the constitution. It rises organically, rises um, as people have different ideas. Uh, they organized into parties. So the first party system is really between 1793 and 1828. And this is the Federalists um, versus the Democratic Republicans. Um, the second party system is from 1828 to 1855. And this is really the Democrats versus the Whigs. Um, and so we will see this going forward. This is going to be a common theme throughout American history is the party system. Um, and so the, these they continue to have a huge influence and these things continue to be seen in politics today.